Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's SaferSim webinar. Um, it's two o'clock here central time, so we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Jacob Hyden and I am a coordinator for SaferSim UTC. Um, and today our webinar is a collaborative project between the University of Iowa and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, today they will be discussing um, how they are using naturalistic driving data to develop simulator scenarios. Um, and with that, I'll introduce one of the first presenters, John Gasper from the University of Iowa. All right, thanks, Jacob. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think we're all really excited to have the opportunity to present uh, this collaborative project, um, which seems like it's had many different pieces and um, at this point has lasted quite a while. So we're uh, I think pretty excited to um, show you some of the work and to talk about some of the possibilities. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction and some of the kind of underlying motivation for all of this work. Um, and then I'll pass it off to my colleague, Sean Allen, who will um, discuss the process for developing some of these simulator scenarios. Um, we'll talk a little bit about data we've collected here, and then uh, we'll pass it over to Kelvin, who will uh, talk about the work on uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison's end, um, and uh, he'll kind of wrap it up with some uh, future directions and kind of where we see this work headed in the future. Cool. Um, obviously, uh, like with all of uh, these projects, uh, we need to thank um, the many, many collaborators um, and people who've made this work possible. Uh, which you can see here, both uh, from the University of Wisconsin and um, the University of Iowa teams. Um, okay, so uh, I want to discuss just some of the very high level motivation for the project. Um, and really, the idea here was to uh, kind of merge what we know um, and some of the advantages of naturalistic data with uh, some of the advantages of simulation to really. Um, Kind of try to connect the two a little bit more. Um, so if we talk about naturalistic data, um, we know that uh, we have a number of advantages here. We're capturing behavior uh, in the context where it's occurring, um, but really that's providing only a single snapshot. So if we have a say a crash event or a lane departure, we're only getting kind of one shot to look at someone's behavior. So we're not um, manipulating things as we would in an experimental setup. Uh, simulation has um, many advantages and disadvantages as well. Um, obviously here we're able to control things in a really safe and experimental way. Um, we're able to draw causative inferences um, about the relationships between different variables. Um, but the challenge here is getting uh, to simulation that really um, translates well back to the real world. Um, so the goal of this project um, in a broad sense was to really um, try to um, better create uh, simulator scenarios that are based on uh, data from naturalistic driving studies. And in an ideal world, um, we would see a pretty high correlation between naturalistic data and uh, the results we see in the simulators. In the real world, um, we see some disparities. So a good example of this would be some of the distraction research that's come out in the last five to 10 years where we see um, some pretty strong effects of cognitive distraction in the context of driving simulation, uh, but somewhat mixed results when we go back and we look at naturalistic data. So um, I think we'll get back to some of the implications for this work, but really the overall goal was to try to bridge those two worlds. Um, so quick overview um, to kind of step through the project, and we'll kind of touch on these different points here. Uh, we wanted to start with um, some naturalistic data, um, some of the SHARP2 data. So we wanted to essentially take some of the locations from SHARP2, translate those into um, a simulator tile, into the simulated environment, and then um, using that simulation, collect some data. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the different uh, environments where uh, data were and will be collected. Uh, but you can see the University of Iowa and the um, University of Wisconsin driving simulators. Here. Um, so I mentioned that we uh, 
wanted to look at some of uh, the locations from Sharp 2. Uh, so the way we went about this was we took um, Shauna Hallmark's um, SO8 reports, um, looking at roadway departures on rural curves. Uh, and we connected with them. We got basically the number of trips that uh, had been recorded in Sharp 2 across these different curve locations that they looked at. And the way we selected the curves um, that we wanted to build for the simulator were was basically to just um, look at the number of trips and to select the curves where we had a lot of trips. So you can see these two curves that we ended up selecting here. Um, these were curves in New York State. I believe, um, and each of these had about 60 uh, unique trips across the curve. So a relatively high number, um, and we'll talk about kind of some of the implications for simulation here in a bit. Um, so with that, I will uh, hand things off uh, to Sean Allen, who will talk a little bit about how we actually go about developing uh, simulation from uh, these naturalistic environments. Thanks, John. So really what I'm trying to uh, help all of you understand is how we get from 3D models or, or data outside the simulator to the uh, simulation where obviously things are affecting and influenced, potentially influenced by the external driver. So that there's an ecosystem in the simulator. Uh, another word for that, I guess, would be architecture. But basically, everything that comes in gets processed. We're not really ingesting anything directly into the simulation environment. And in our case, that's mainly because there's a, a probably a few hundred man years of development that's been expended in the creation of things like the ISAT event editor uh, and the scenario object library where all of our objects reside. And basically everything that the computer needs to know about exists in either the scenario world or the scenario object library. Once we get down into the simulation level, then there's really no such thing as a tile model or uh, you know, a separate entity from that. But basically what I'm gonna talk about in my slides will consist mostly of this top these top three nodes where we're bringing 3D model data in to make a tile model, and then we're making some, uh, we're developing a bunch of stuff for that in order to be able to drive on it and so that it looks reasonable. And then all of that gets integrated with the rest of our assets in the TMT world editor, where we configure the road and figure that we want to drive for X numbers of minutes at such and such a speed, and we want the environment to contain this, that, and the other thing, uh, and the TMT is where we do that. So really the most important thing in our tile model development is the roadway, and Kelvin and the team at Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin, provided us with a geometric model of our sharp two curves. And looking, you know, just looking at the satellite imagery, you can see that it seems to track fairly well. And the ribbon that was delivered is just geometry and we really can't do anything with that. So uh, one of the first things that we do is we figure out, well, what's the center line of the road? And the way we accomplish that is we basically apply a shading algorithm to the geometry, which assigns a surface normal to the geometry. And now with that operation, we have not only the position, which is embedded as part of the geometry, but now we also have surface orientation. And this is important for things like uh, simulated traffic that travels along this roadway so that it follows the banking of the roadway correctly. All of that information is stored in the normal. And then the next part of this would be to build any additional pieces of the road network that's not present in the model, which as you can see here, there is a four-way intersection with crossroads that are perpendicular to our, our main road. And the request was made to in integrate that into the tile model because that's what's in the real world and therefore it could have an in impact on people traveling uh, through the environment. So as part of that effort, building a, an intersection is 
not as straightforward as it might seem. We have to calculate basically the minimum curvature for each segment that connects from lane A, road A, to the destination road and the destination lane. And that's the point at which the, the road needs to end and the intersection begin. In the NADS simulation environment, roads and intersections are very tightly correlated, but they are somewhat uh, distinct entities. So, it, and it's necessary because without this structure, basically we would have two independent road networks where traffic going from east to west would not know anything about the traffic that's going north to south. And this is independent of this particular experiment. Uh, typically, I'm, we're required to build environments that are multi-purpose, and so this is just kind of like standard operating procedure. And what we see on this slide is how the the main road in A is kind of this diagonal road, uh, and there are two oddly shaped curves that sort of originate in the lower left corner. And if we look at the textured views, you can see how that tracks pretty closely to the geometry of the roadway. And all of this is predicated from the satellite imagery uh, courtesy of Google Earth. So in B, we see that the standard tools that would be used normally to generate these corridor connections uh, doesn't really accommodate the curve very well. And so for this particular tile, an alternate method was researched to use spline uh, splines instead of the, the typical tool. And that allowed the shape to be pretty much whatever it needed to be. And then from there, the process is very much like the finding the road center line where a geometry is constructed, it gets sliced and shaded, and then those points get extracted into the connection nodes. So now we can go from road A to road B through this uh, intersection junction. And here we can see that that connection, this is a logical view using ISAT to show that an ADO or a simulated vehicle can travel from our source road to our destination road. And just for the purposes of this presentation, I've disabled all of the uh, standard signs at the intersection because otherwise it would clutter the view. And the knot of uh, lines here in the center, they basically represent all of the various connections that are possible here and ISAT's just drawing all of that at one go. And this path is highlighted because this vehicle has been instructed to turn right at the next intersection, which is you know, what we've been talking about. So as far as the replication of the environment, uh, there are many levels. Uh, it's kind of a spectrum, I would say, where at the minimum end, you have the roadway geometry and probably road markings to correlate with the real world location. And at the maximum, you'd have a simulation environment that tracks very closely to your real world environment. And in our case, since we didn't have LIDAR, the determination was basically what, what's really important for the road driver. Uh, you know, Obviously, things adjacent to the roadway, things that would affect performance on the road, such as signage. Those elements were considered necessary, and you can you can sort of see here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to discount the obvious changes in focal length and uh, aspect ratio of the views, but here we can see that the main feature of the slant and pole is replicated pretty well in the simulated environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So as far as features go, it's, it's really, you just take a trip down the road and see, you know, what is it that you can actually see from the roadway. And then it's a matter of how much time and budget allows as far as identifying and constructing these elements. So here, obviously, we've got a, a fairly noticeable element present in this uh, row of bermed trees. And then there's a fairly unique house. So the primary concern here was just like, you know, if you had like a two second view of this environment, would it look consistent with the real world location? And so little things like the basketball hoop and, and clutter that's present in the street view 
are not present in the simulated environment, but some of the more major elements uh, in general are. You can see we've even got the color of the shed here uh, is replicated fairly well in the simulated environment. Now, how that all tracks with uh, driver performance, it would be John's domain to discuss, but as far as I was concerned, my main uh, concern was making sure that major elements were present in the simulator model so that at least, you know, stuff around the road was there. Now, in terms of placing the tile in the environment, because we were very careful when we created the, the model that uh, we reused all of our standard conventions, which means things have to be a certain size, uh, the roads have to be behaving in a certain way at the boundaries of the model. Uh, lanes have to be consistent with the standard lane definitions that we use. Really using this model was as simple as a plug and play operation. And what I've done here is the, the world environment is in the upper right corner. So you can see the tile is highlighted. And so it's oriented as it would be in the real world uh, traveling from north to south. And currently in the simulator, we don't have any real way of orienting the driver to their um, to their orientation. So we don't have a compass in the car that says, hey, you're traveling north or northwest, like what we would see in, in our vehicles. So in that sense, the simulated environment is, is pretty much unitless. But uh, it's horizontal on this slide, really, only so that I can make it larger to show how the route of travel you know, could incorporate any of these major or minor loops, which means that this environment can be used not only for this experiment where we're concerned about driver performance around the sharp tooth curves, but also in the context of a larger drive um, for other reasons. And I think, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, so th thanks, Sean. That was a really great um, overview of some of the work. And I want to emphasize the amount of work that um, went into um, creating some of the features there. And you can see uh, how closely um, we tried to match certain features in certain areas there. Um, I want to give um, just kind of a very quick overview of um, our approach to data collection. And then I'll show some videos which actually show uh, drivers on the curve in the simulator. Um, so we used um, the Nat National Advanced Driving Simulator here at the University of Iowa. This is the NADS-1 simulator. Um, so this is a very high fidelity uh, simulator with a large motion envelope, uh, 360 degrees of visuals. Um, and Kel Kelvin will talk a little bit about their simulator as well. But you can see uh, basically our sim uh, consists of this vehicle inside of this dome, which is moving, which is replicating uh, motion cues here. Uh, what you're seeing here is just a general drive um, or several different uh, general driving environments. Uh, but I wanted to give a sense for uh, the tool that we're using to look at driver behavior. Um, so Sean mentioned integrating uh, this naturalistic tile into the context of larger experiments. Uh, and this is something that we're working on uh, quite a bit here um, in order to create these kind of larger virtual worlds, um, something that we refer to as Springfield, which is essentially our virtual proving ground. So the way we went about this was to integrate uh, that tile into an existing experiment and then integrate that experiment into our uh, larger virtual proving ground. So you can think of this as kind of this living, expanding organism that's um, we're kind of adding pieces to, um, and you can get an idea for the size and some of the features that you can see in this database. Um, so in terms of data collection, um, one of the nice things, as Sean mentioned, is that um, we can take these uh, simulator tiles that we've created, and we can actually integrate them into the context of other experiments. So um, it isn't necessarily the case that we just have to collect data on this single tile. We can plug this tile into a different experiment, which really allows us to offset the cost of collecting um, some of these data, especially on a larger platform like the NADS-1. Um, so what we did here is we um, 
we leveraged in an, an, another ongoing data collection, um, and we got about we got 61 drivers, uh, roughly half younger and half older, um, half male and female, uh, give or take. Uh, and we had them drive through this environment, uh, which consisted uh, first, so they kind of started up at the green balloon up here, uh, my mouse, uh, started up here and kind of worked their way down. So you can see them working their way down through uh, the naturalistic tile. And then uh, we basically uh, started our drive with that. And then we finished out with about 15 minutes of driving, which um, comprised the remaining portion of the experiment. So Basically, we're plugging in uh, this uh, naturalistic tile into the context of a larger experiment, which gives us a lot more bang for the buck, essentially. Um, we also wanted to look at um, different variables. And what I'm going to talk about here, this is, you can think of it as kind of a proof of concept. Uh, but we also gave some drivers uh, secondary tasks, which was just a manual text entry task on the infotainment display. Uh, so they got cues saying, please enter the word sunset, and they had to type in sunset uh, when they got that cue. Um, and uh, kind of the impression I want to give or the takeaway I'd like everyone to have from this is that uh, being able to bring these naturalistic tiles into simulation allows us to look at um, variables like distraction or driver age or gender uh, in a much more controlled way. And so we were able to collect data from 60 drivers, which you'll remember is about the number of original traces from Sharp 2, um, really over just a couple weeks of data collection. And we were able to manipulate these things experimentally. Um, OK, so I'm going to show a few examples uh, which uh, show um, a couple drivers driving through uh, these naturalistic curves. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the first is a younger driver here. Um, and you'll see, I think both of them will perform uh, that distraction task uh, within the context of the curve. Um, another thing worth mentioning while you're watching is um, some of the breadth of data and the sensitivity of data that we're able to collect from these interactions. So you can see him uh, typing sunset out. Uh, on the infotainment display, you can see a near lane departure there with some oncoming traffic. Um, I'll get back to the breadth of data, but you can see um, really how nice the visual scene looks uh, and how rich it looks. Um, and again, we're recreating these rural driving situations, but we're replicating some features which could really make a difference. So some of these driveways uh, that you'll see that you're seeing, um, some of the other features throughout the drive. Um, you're also able to see uh, the eye tracking uh, being coded up here uh, in the right, uh, the top right panel, um, which is giving essentially a kick out of where he's looking at any given time. Um, and again, we're able to collect really a broad range of data, um, much more sensitive and many more variables than you'd be able to collect uh, in an on-road setting. So I'm going to skip ahead to the next driver here. Um, so this is an older driver uh, driving through the same uh, same curve naturalistic section. Sorry, you can hear our operator talking. That wasn't the subject couldn't hear. Um, you'll see her get the same cue to perform the distraction task. Um, and you'll get a sense for some of the differences that we can observe uh, based on driver age in this case. So uh, if we're looking at things like secondary task interactions, uh, she's going to take like more than a minute before she actually looks down and starts to interact with that task. Uh, whereas the younger driver uh, that we showed starts interacting with it pretty much immediately.
She'll get to it here, I promise. There we go. Okay, so, so you get a sense for our ability to uh, kind of take a large sample of drivers and a diverse sample of drivers, put them in the same situations, which allows us to talk about things like causation and to manipulate things um, in a way that we wouldn't if we're just looking at those snapshots from naturalistic data. Um, here's just uh, kind of a broad summary of some of the measures we're able to extract uh, from the simulator scenarios. Um, we can break it down into um, the approach to the curve and actually driving through the curve. We can look at changes in uh, lane position, changes uh, once drivers start interacting with the secondary task. Um, as I mentioned, we can look at um, the nature of those interactions, so when drivers start interacting, um, how long it takes drivers to actually get the word in there, how many glances they take away from the road. Uh, so we really have a wealth of data which we're able to extract from these scenarios. Um, I want to just show a few examples of some of the outcomes uh, in this little proof of concept study that we ran. Um, so you can look at approach speed here. This is uh, speed as drivers are actually approaching uh, both the first and second stretch of curves in there. Uh, and you can see differences um, as a function of things like driver age uh, with older drivers as we would expect driving or approaching the curve slower. Um, and you see this uh, pretty nice interaction between age and distraction where undistracted drivers are showing um, considerably less speed than uh, drivers who are distracted uh, for the older driver group. Um, if we look at behavior in curves, um, and again, one of the nice things is that we're able to really clearly break out what we mean in, in terms of approach and curve, and we can look at very uh, precise sections of the roadway. Um, on the left here is steering wheel manipulation, um, standard deviation, and steering wheel position. Uh, on the right is uh, mean speed as drivers are going through the curve. And again, here you see things like um, differences between our age groups. Uh, on the right, you can see, ag again, an um, interaction with distraction. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on the results, but I, wanna sh I just wanted to can give an overview of really the broad set of measures that we're able to extract. Uh, and finally here, this is uh, lane departures. So we're able to get a really good sense of uh, the percentage of drivers who are departing the lane under a variety of conditions. You can see here again, um, some age and uh, distraction effects, uh, distraction as we would predict increasing the likelihood of departing the lane. Um, so I'm gonna, sorry about that. I'm gonna hand uh, things off now to Kelvin. Um, and he's going to cover uh, kind of the Wisconsin portion and some of the data they're uh, collecting and, and then wrap up with some kind of future questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Can you guys hear me? Um, just want to confirm, can someone tell me if they can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Kevin. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, John. So what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about uh, the Wisconsin side of things. Um, obviously, we have a smaller fidelity simulator, so it's uh, almost fixed. It only, ha it only has one degree of freedom. So it provides the feeling of acceleration and deceleration. Uh, so our scope is going to be severely more limited. We're getting closer to running subjects on the same si type of curves. So we're going to focus on understanding the geometry. But before we go ahead and do that, one thing that we need to do is actually bring back those tiles that we got from, from Nats. And sometimes things get a little bit complicated when you transfer things from, the, from simulator to simulator. So even thought the first thing we did is send the geometry to Nats in a simple model. Once it gets converted, add it into their own model things come back to us and they're not in a plug and play situation. So we had to handle a, a new texturing approach, compatibility between files. For example, the texturing files that NAS uses are not compatible with the textures that RTI uses. Uh, 
the role with metadata is defined uh, in a different way depending on which interface you use for the creation of the environment. And obviously we have to handle those platform effects, those limitations that I mentioned that our simulator doesn't have the degree of fidelity that the NATS has. We also have to take into consideration the, the nature of the visual database. It's, it, we have to strip it down a little, a little bit more than what is, uh, what is done there. So that's why our study will be focused more on the, on the simple geometry. So we're still working on that part. Uh, but what I want to talk about on the next slide is basically um, what are we going to focus on? So we're going to focus on, again, the geometry, the geometry of the road for subjects. So like what happens when people are entering the curves? So from our, from our perspective, in our lab, one of the things that we're, we're interested in is on the outside world, what happens outside the vehicle? What happens, how do we see the vehicles entering a curve? How do we see the vehicles navigating through a curve? We look at the macro, at the macro of things, and we're interested in a lot in two things: uh, the speed profile of vehicles. So we want to see how people navigate, how people enter that curve. What is the speed when they approach the the PC of the curve, and what is the the speed when they are in the middle of the curve? Things like things like that. We're also obviously interested in lane deviations because high speed, high lane deviation, you get a chance for a run of the road crash. Therefore, that doesn't end well. And in the next slide, so the, the first thing that we thought about when we were starting this project is how things started. It's like, well, what if we have sharp two data? It's like, well, that's a, good, that's a great thing. We can have, for example, 60 trips on one curve of naturalistic data. And while that seems like a lot of information, it's very limited when we compare with uh, other types of data sets that from, from the perspective of transportation engineering we're, we're used to dealing with. For example, if we want to understand the behavior of drivers on a curve, do we want to go with 60 paths, 60 traces of data, or can we go with thousands of, of data points on that curve? One can argue that the more data that we have in the curve, the better we understand the variances, the better we understand how people navigate on that curve. Um, the question is, do we have that data? Sadly, the answer is like we don't have that late, that amount of data at the level that we have sharp sharp two data. So we're not going to have like in camera uh, video recordings. We're not going to have uh, detailed uh, information about how drivers react, but can we actually get the speed profile of vehicles? And that's the question. It's like, can we do? Can we do this? And what I'm going to show ahead is that this type of data, this type of naturalistic data, doesn't is not limited with sharp with sharp two. And in the next slide, this experiment um, that I'm going to show is some tests that we conducted in the past. So we rely on some technology that we have um, prepared for obtaining naturalistic data on the on the field. In other words, um, high resolution data. If any one of you are familiar with something that's called a NGSIM data set, it's like with vehicle path traces at a very high resolution. So we wanted to see can we obtain detailed vehicle profiles as they navigate uh, a roadway environment. Can we understand how people react to the presence of a sign on the road? Traditional approaches, you might have seen this, is like the police, it's like a police gun, like a speed gun. They go ahead and they shoot speeds on the road and they kind of estimate the speeds. But can we actually get naturalistic style vehicle profiles in which we know where are vehicles every 0.25 seconds, every 0.5 seconds, what is their speed? When do they start to decrease at what location do they do that? And the answer to that is that yes, it can be done. And what you see on the screen here, it's some equipment that we have used, and it's like a simple experiment done on a on a speed feedback sign. Those things that tell you what the speed that you're driving at is, do people actually react to those? And in this experiment, what we did is that we installed multiple multiple radar devices, and 
we connected them to a computer, we placed them upstream of the sign, downstream of the sign, and we were able to come up with speed profiles for every vehicle that approaches uh, a sign. Um, if you go on the, on the next slide, what that allows us to do is that it lets us analyze what is the reaction of drivers as they approach a feature, a uh, trans uh, roadway feature. In this case, it's a sign. I'm going to talk about the, the, the speed soon, the curve soon. But the idea here is that if we know a point in the, on the road, let's say we are understand the behavior of drivers on a sharp two curve, we have the behavior on the driving simulation side of things. We have the behavior on the sharp two side of things. What can we get if we actually sit down by a curve, or not sit down, but just collect data continuously in a curve for, say, a day or two days, and monitor the behavior of every single driver, monitor the behavior of commuters on that, on that road, all that stuff. What this graph shows you is that for that particular sign that I mentioned, we were able to get the changes in speed as a reaction. When they saw the sign, what happened? Did they increase the speed? Did they reduce the speed? Did they pretty much ignore it, or they just made a small adjustments? If you look at the data there, it tells us that yeah, people make an effort, one or two miles. Uh, that's pretty much it. Some people actually take it as a, as a cue, like, hey, I wasn't driving as fast as I thought, and they increase their, their speed a little bit. So the, what this proves is that we can, actually, we can actually do it. And if we go to the next slide, the, what I'm showing you in here is like, well, again, think of it from, from the perspective of a curve. We have in here, we monitored, we have analyzed the trajectory of every single vehicle that goes through the road. And we know exactly at what location someone starts to reduce their speed when they get an indication. Most people start to reduce their speed about 1,200 to 1,400 feet upstream of that sign. So once they see that sign, they see that thing flashing, they know that they're, oh, I'm driving too fast. That's a cue. The same thing could apply if we're using something like a like a curve. And in the case of a curve, I want to show you um, what we're going to use for to demonstrate the feasibility of collecting data on the on the next slide. So, going back to the idea of can we collect naturalistic style data, but collect it from the side of the road? Um, on the, on the slide, what you see is um, a little device that we have used to collect curve data, actually. And the device, as you can see, is powered with solar. Um, it's mounted on the side of the road, attached to a pole. So it's pretty easy to, to deploy in the field. It's very inconspicuous, so you're not going to, drivers don't really notice it, so they don't react to it in the same way that they react to a sign. And what we can do is we can place it on poles. We can actually use like a tripod if needed. But what it tells us is that if we leave this device running for a while on a curve, what you can what you can achieve is just in an hour, you can obtain the same number of data points that you will that you will find available on the sharp two, on the sharp two data sets for a particular for a particular curve. What we did in this field test is that we took the device out to a to a curve, collect the data, and what you will see on the screen is like the dashed lines that you're seeing. That's the average speed. Uh, it's average observations for all the speeds. For example, we know that 140 meters upstream of the PC of the curve, or upstream of the device, the 95 percentile speed was between, was approximately 55 miles an hour, while the fifth percentile speed was 30 miles uh, 30 miles an hour. The solid line that you see on the screen, that's actually the speed profile of, a, of an individual vehicle. So this is showing you how a vehicle compares to the general behavior that we observe on the curve. And as you can see, we know exact, the exact speed that the vehicle had when they entered the, the PC of the curve. And that's what you see on the, on the curve. Um, interesting, in the curve that we conducted this demonstration study, the advisory speed was 25 miles an hour. So you can see that people are really 
speeding up on this curve as opposed to what they should be doing. They're coming from a 55 mile, 45, 55 mile an hour zone. They are entering a, a curve with an advisory speed of 25 miles an hour. And 95% of the people are definitely doing at least over 30 miles an hour on that curve. We know that they, they reduce the speed. We see that on the, on the data. We know when they start to reduce it, but we know that when they enter the curve, they're still they're still bad in the in the behavior. Um, so again, this is only a, a a demonstration of a of a vehicle speed profile. So what I want to show you on the next slide is where do we think we can go with this in the in the future? Uh, again, different type of curve this time. So what we've done, what we did in this example, is something we tried a, a, a while ago, and I just want to apply to, to this presentation, is that we took this the same device, we installed it on a curve, and we were able to understand what is the speed of vehicles as they navigate the curve. On the screen, you will see that upstream of the curve, vehicles are approximately entering at 53 miles an hour. The moment they enter the curve, at about the PC of the curve, now they have reduced their speed to 38 mile to 38 miles an hour. And by the middle of the curve, their speed is approximately 35 miles an hour. What this tells us is like um, using the, the system that we have developed, we can actually obtain naturalistic data in a in a larger in a larger and wider way than the sharp two data sets that are available. They're not as detailed because we don't have information about inside what's happening inside the vehicle, but we do get a very broad speed profile that allows us to understand what roadway features, what perhaps signing on the road, what markings on the road can actually lead to better designs and curves so that people obey the, the advisory speed limits or that make them realize that, hey, you're driving too fast. So what we can do with this is essentially take a three-stage three, three approach to understanding behavior and curves. One of them is like full-scale simulation with a high-fidelity device like NATS. Um, the other one is using the, the Sharp 2 data sets. And this other one is by using um, high-resolution data collected from the side of the road using, using radar devices. When we do this, what we're going to end up with is a better understanding of of curves. We're going to end up with a better understanding of what uh, features we can place on the road to improve driving compliance. We can understand why at a location people might be might be running on the roads, and all that is possible if we understand curves using those three that three stage approach. Okay, I think that's uh, that's all that's all I have on my end. So. Let's open this for questions, I guess, John. Okay, thanks, Kevin. I'm gonna let Jacob hop back in here. Um. Okay. Yeah, great presentation, everyone. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen so we can get back to the regular um, box. Yeah, let's, let's open up the chat box for any questions or discussions um, if anyone has anything. We have a couple people typing uh, right now. So Stephen asks, what specific variable was displayed as lane deviation from the video? Um, I believe that was uh, distance from the, uh, the center of the lane. Let me try to get back. I can get back um, into the PowerPoint. It's it's okay. 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 Uh, that, that's it. Yeah, that, that's the measure that we typically use to calculate things like standard deviation and lane position, distance from the center of the lane. Uh, my tracking device. Um, we don't know that. Yeah. Or was there a name of that variable in Minuten? Uh, I'd have to look it up. I think there is. 
we we could uh, we can connect with you and uh, let you know yeah. the exact measures that we're using and how we're calculating them. Uh, okay. Yep. Stephen, we'll uh, have someone. If you, we'll give you oh. the email address or uh, at the end, um, but we'll we'll get you that answer. Um, next question, Nelson. He asked, "Are there any repositories of radar data that may be accessible for learning to process this type of data?" Also, what type of eye tracking devices did you use? Okay, um, so I can take the eye tracking devices. Ours is a uh, face lab system. Um, Kelvin, I don't know if you guys do eye tracking inside your sim, but maybe I'll divert the second question your way as well. Okay, so for for eye tracking, um, we don't plan on doing our, our tra eye tracking for for this particular experiment. We're really interested on the speed profile of vehicles, mostly for design applications. Um, in terms of the repository of data, that is something that I'm definitely looking forward to working on. I I want to start putting together a sample sample data sets, and I think this will be a, a good project to start to start with. So I'll definitely look into submitting something like that and making it available online once the once the report is finalized. Okay, so when talking about approach velocity, are you talking about instantaneous measurement or an average value in a time series? Um, yeah, so we're talking about an aggregate measure uh, in the context at least of what I showed up there. We're talking about a measure calculated over a certain distance. Um, again, uh, we were able to break that up. So Kelvin mentioned a couple times being able to look at Specific, more specific points um, throughout that curve tile or throughout that uh, real curve. Um, so w one step that we can take beyond this is to kind of further explore exactly where those bounds should be. Um, but in the context of what I showed, it's, it's an aggregate measure over um, a distance prior to the curve. So what does standard deviation of steering wheel angle tell us when all participants drive the same route? Measure of jerkiness? Um, yeah, essentially I would contend that it um, in some ways represents the amount of manipulation drivers are doing uh, uh, as they're navigating a certain section of, in this case, section of the curve. Um, there's other values there that are probably also really informative, um, like the uh, degree of deviation in steering wheel position or the amount of steering wheel reversals, things like that. Um, and like I said, there's a wealth of different measures that we can pull here to try to give us a picture of how drivers are behaving in a certain situation. Okay, good questions. Um, we'll give it a couple more moments here for any other last questions or comments. So the question is, was the IRB hard to get for setting up your custom radar sensor to collect data um, from the general public without formal consent? I think that's a question for you, Kelvin. 
So basically, the radar sensor doesn't really collect any personal identifiable information. So when, in fact, uh, these radar devices are often installed already at intersections, so all we have to do is log the vehicle trajectory data. We don't get any license plate information. We don't get any vehicle model. We don't get anything anything about it. So there's nothing. When we submitted this for for IRB a while ago, they say, "Yep, you're good to you're good to go. Just make sure that you have the consent of the agency on which you're installing the the devices." So um, the IRB for collecting radar data is different than the IRB for collecting simulator data. Is there any way to calibrate the speed perception in NADS MiniSim? Um, I think that's a, a very good question. So one of the things we'll be able to address here um, is we'll be able to look across different platforms with different levels of fidelity to look at just basic things like speed. Um, our, I think our broader one of the broader goals here is to try to um, get an understanding uh, when we look back at the Sharp 2 data for how um, behavior in simulation might differ uh, from naturalistic behavior that we see. And I think um, that's going to be a really important um, step in kind of understanding how we get from uh, naturalistic uh, data to being able to look at behavior in simulation that really mirrors what's happening. So I, I think we're still, in some ways, trying to understand uh, that process of speed perception and kind of what goes into uh, getting that to where it should be across different simulator platforms. Um, I don't know if you guys want to chime in as well. But... Well, Stephen, uh, I think I've got some information I can I can send to you that relates to general uh, speed perception and simulation. I don't really have any any tips or uh, comments regarding calibration on the mini sim in particular, other than to acknowledge that uh, we know that there's an issue, and part of that, of course, is your peripheral uh, view is is quite limited. In the NADS one, we've got 360 degrees, so there's no problem with the horizontal or peripheral, uh, you know, visual flow, but that's different on you know, on other simulation platforms. So I will send you what I have. So kind of transitioning into this next question, um, between the 360 degree video platform that we see in the NADS one and the, mini the monitor type setups, do you typically um, see different rates of sim sickness then? Um, I would say the general answer there is yes. Um, the better you can replicate some of those cues, um, both visual and the motion cues, um, the better you're going to do in terms of reducing sim sickness. A lot depends on the type of scenario that you're trying to look at. Um, so if you're looking at really complex intersections with a lot of left-hand turns for older drivers, um, that's probably going to you're probably going to see bigger differences in the rates of simulated sickness um, based on the type of platform you're using. I think that would that would be my general answer there. Um, I don't know um, necessarily in the context of this study on these curves what the rates of sickness will be between the two groups. I can say at NADS we had almost no sickness driving through this curve. So. Yeah, so I would say, Stephen, those rates are consistent. What I've seen in some 
medium fidelity simulators, uh, like for instance, the one I worked with at Illinois, um, I think our rates here are a little bit lower, maybe 5% or less, depending on the scenario. And, and to answer your last question, Stephen, I guess uh, uh, those cues, like getting those same cues, I think one important question that remains is what those imp those really important cues are. So Sean alluded to uh, trying to replicate as many of those cues as we could, and especially the ones we thought might be uh, really important for behavior. But I think a question remains as to what cues are really important that we need to replicate in simulation in order to get realistic driving behavior. 